Welcome back to GCSAA TV Live, presented in partnership with Lebanon Turf, live from the 2017 Golf Industry Show here in Orlando, Florida. My name's Kevin Sunderman, and this afternoon I'm joined by Dan Dinelli, golf course superintendent at North Shore Country Club. How you doing, Dan? Good, Kevin. How about you? Not too bad. Wonderful. I guess you, uh, guess you came to talk to us a little bit about biochar and a study that you've done. Yeah, biochar, basically what got me interested in biochar is the, the club that I'm at, North Shore Country Club, we are going to rebuild our 18 greens. And in doing so, years, about 19 years ago, we built a research green and um, with 20 different red zone amendments. And it was one of those uh, NTEP trials that was funded by the USGA, GCSA, and, and NTEP. So, we took it upon ourselves to expand upon the variety trial and tested some ridge zone mixes at the same time on the same green. So the entire facility was managed the same. And um, fast forward to today from 19 years ago, we were observing and documenting how that green evolved over that time. And it was fascinating the changes that we witnessed. And one of those changes is the uh, peat, the few cells that had peat, there was things like axis and profile, Zia Pro, earthworm castings, um, compost, straight sand in one mix, sphagnum peat, Dakota reed sedge is kind of our industry standards, right? So what we discovered was the organic matter that that green originally started out with, we lost about half of it. So the original 12 inch root zone was leaning out as the top portion where you sand top dress and the organic matter that you're diluting with the top dressing, right. that built up in 19 years to be about a four inch cap. So that organic matter content was high, like 2%. So there was like this division, if you will, what we call a bi-layered uh, uh, root zone that it, it ended up maturing into. So it got me interested in studying what are options out there that might persist longer and offer the characteristics that we're looking for that would better mate or match that top dressing horizon as it grows in depth as we continue to sand top dress, or I should say, say continues in height. And um, biochar is one of these materials that it's a charcoal-like material that is very persistent. It's a carbon, but it's graphite-like. So it's not an energy source for, for biology generally, unlike other, you know, many other carbon sources. And, um, and it, there's a picture of it on the screen there. So um, that's right. what kind of got me interested in All it. All right, so you said it's uh, graphite-like, and you said it's charcoal-like. Right. So what is it? <laughs> Confusing, right? <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Um, well, it's charcoal-like in, 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 I guess, in appearance in nature, but the carbon element of it is, um, I don't know, stabilize is the right word, but I'll use that term for lack of better terms. So it's graphite-like material, and that's why it's a carbon-type material. It's like diamonds are made out of carbon, right? And diamonds are not going to break down anytime soon. Okay. So, you know, there's all different types of carbon, and uh, so when you, well, let me try to explain how biochar is generally made. So there's the process of pyrolysis that is an energy generating process. And what that is basically is uh, heating up any type of organic material, usually like wood, it could be grass, it could be corn stubble, coconut hulls, anything organic. And you heat it up to a point where the volatile organic compounds, the VOCs, start to gas off and they ignite. And what's left behind is about 50% of that carbon. So unlike traditional burning something where there's oxygen feeding the fire and a lot of it goes off in the atmosphere as CO2, when you utilize the process of pyrolysis to make the char, you're actually reducing the amount of oxygen or actually trying to eliminate the oxygen feeding that flame. So it's a very intense heating process that heats up those VOCs and leaves that carbon skeleton behind, as seen that's in that image there. Okay. So, what are the characteristics? What makes it unique? It's a great so, question. So, um, I see biochar a lot like compost, where there's a lot of different ways to kind of make it, and the, free, the feedstock makes a difference on what it is. And it, a lot of it boils down to the pore space. 
Okay. So again, in that one image, you'll see like that top yeah. image, you can see all those pores. So all that surface area with the slight charge that it has is really attracted to nutrients. So it has a high CEC associated with it. So that cation exchange capacity um, attracts cations and eventually anions and it's a wonderful way to hold the nutrients for plant availability and not have it leach out, much like other organic matter does. But again, this one is going to stick around for, a, for hundreds of years. It's, um, it's actually been an ancient practice in the Amazon River Basin, Terrapada, I think is what they called it, and they, they're not exactly sure how they did it, but they actually, back then, the natives there actually converted this forest-type soil into highly productive material. And another thing that's kind of interesting about biochar in its natural state is that our corn belt, right, to the heart of the United States, highly productive soil generally from the prairie grasslands, right, that, that, that grew there, right? right? So some of that organic matter that made it so productive was from the annual cycling of the biology and the plant life and the manures and stuff that would die and, and redeposit in the soil system. But if you're a biochar guy studying biochar, you know, prairies are fun. If you talk to a bird guy, it's really not a prairie unless the prairie <laughs> chickens are there, right? right? It's really not a prairie unless the bisons are there if you're a mammal guy, right? So if you're a biochar guy, it's really not a prairie soil unless there's biochar there because the burns that would take place, whether through natural lightning strikes or through the Native Americans where they claim they would burn some, uh, pretty often. So if you ever really studied how a prairie burns, it's really hot. You can't get near it. It's really intense heat. And you'll see the flames dancing up high, and if you study down near the surface, it's smoldering. You'll actually see the little smoke in that. Well, that heat is so intense, and the oxygen is being utilized so quickly, it starves that lower horizon and the fire itself, and guess what comes? Char. And so that dark soil, part of that element, and part of the reason that we can grow corn and soybeans so well today is because of this natural process of pyrolysis depositing Char. Now, isn't that cool? It is cool. <laughs> How, how'd you come across this? Uh, just, I, I really don't know a specific, you know, moment in time or whatever, but just, you know, studying the different options that take place. You know, there's so many different recipes out there on how to grow things, right. planting medium, and I'm not suggesting, you know, one doesn't work over the other, but I was really looking for something that I felt was going to help balance that bi-layered root zone that these high sand base root zones mature into. And part of that is trying to match the CEC and the water holding capacity in the original mix with what I know is going to end up happening on top of that as I continue to top dress and build up the organic matter that the plant's sloughing off. All right, so how's it doing? Good question. I wish I would have started this 20 years ago or 19 <laughs> years ago with that research green. If you noticed, I didn't mention biochar back then and, and all those options. but. But I'm fortunate, I got Cale Bigelow at Purdue looking at it with Kevin, um, Steve Vaughn, actually we got a couple papers co-authored on it from the USDA down in Peoria. So I do have bona fide scientists, you know, uh, helping me with this process of trying to get comfortable with what we're going to do. And at North Shore Country Club, I've got quite a few greenhouse studies, um, you know, in the tubes like the scientists do, and out in the field. And, you know, the oldest one's two years old. This concern or this uh, goal of mine, I guess I should say, is really more of a long-term uh, vision uh, that I'm trying to uh, forecast and hopefully successfully, because I do know, for example, peat does, we do a, lose a component of that peat. And uh, I think that's, you know, I don't think that's a benefit. Right. Um, so we're, How's the, how's the application come in? I mean, is it just during construction? Is it something that we can do through maintenance, through airification practice, top dressing yeah. practice? So that's a real good question. Right now, obviously, I'm trying to dive in deep with it being a ridge zone amendment and have it be mixed throughout at like a 5 to 10%, mixing compost in with it. Because one of the other elements it has, besides the water and, and uh, air holding capacity with all those pores and the nutrients that are attracted to it as well with the CEC, but if you look at that picture again, there's the one below it, and you'll see all those little, looks like little grains of rice. Right. Those are all bacteria. 
So the other thing that biochar offers, and this is getting to be studied more and more now, the scientific community is really starting to get engaged in trying to learn how to identify a quality char, how to make a quality char, what is a quality char, just like we went through the curve with compost, you know. But, um, but basically what I'm getting at is that all those cavities end up being habitat niches. So the predator-prey relationship that we kind of see, you know, on TV with Africa and the lion, you know, chasing down the zebra or whatever, the same thing holds true under this ground, that there's a predator-prey relationship there. There's a lot of chemical warfare that's pretty cool and serious down there where these microbes are trying to maintain, you know, maintain their niche and their elbow room and their space. So if those little holes, for example, those cavities are big enough for the bacteria to inhabit, but yet small enough for like protozoa can't get in there and consume it, now that's a little protective niche for that strain of, you know, for that type of bacteria. So that's kind of the general concept there. So I'm also very interested in seeing how we can pre-treat the biochar with certain biology, a pro with, with a community of organisms that act like a probiotic and jumpstart the system with favorable organisms in hopes that it cycles nutrients better, creates a healthier rhizosphere, protects the plant's roots from, from pathogenic activity, perhaps suppress nematodes. There's a lot of different things that can happen on a favorable basis. The challenge is understanding all those dynamics and, and, and dialing that in, which, you know, that's pretty, science, that's pretty heavy science. And, Fortunately, we have researchers in our industry right now that's studying the phytobiome, and they're going to learn more and more about uh, the dynamics of the plant's relationship with these organisms. So the best we can do right now is offer favorable soil-like environment that has the habitat, the proper nutrients, the proper air and water holding, and, and these niches for hopefully the favorable bi biology to persist in. It definitely sounds interesting and, and potentially um, offers uh, a lot of good. Um, but we all heard the story about the woman that had to swallow the spider to catch the fly. Is there any fears of anything like that? Are we introducing something that maybe isn't what we want in our golf course ah, greens? You're full of good questions here. So <laughs> <laughs> there is because um, it is so persistent. This material is going to stick around for right. hundreds to maybe thousands. So whatever you do, it's going to stick around. So I have a similar question. We assume that the biology that's going to inhabit this is going to be favorable to biology. Suppose a disease-causing organism that's soil-borne finds a safe haven. I don't know the answer to that. Right. But there's a general philosophy out there. First of the table gets served. Squatter's rights. <laughs> however you want to term it. And generally speaking, when, when organisms occupy a niche, it, it takes quite a bit of effort for other organisms to come in and, 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 and take it over. Not, I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but generally that's what I'm banking on, and that's why I feel it's important to mix these materials with a, a quality compost and or some of the probiotics that we are messing around with, for lack of better words, I guess, bugs in a jug, you know? Um, but we're trying to make it a community-oriented approach in doing this and setting up this community to be robust enough that it has that, that resiliency. So what's next? Where do you see this going? What, oh boy. What, what do you think we're talking about next There's year? There's so much cool stuff. So one of the things is getting back to that plant microbe relationship. There's a lot of signaling taking place, right? Plants give up like 10, 15, 20% of its energy as exudates through the roots. In a highly competitive environment, that's a pretty heavy taxation, I would think. Maybe our government doesn't think that is, but I think that's pretty heavy. So <laughs> there's got to be a good reason for that. And through those exudates, these plants are developing relationships. That zone around the root, right, the rhizosphere, the biology around that zone is about 10 times generally greater than the biology outside of that area of influence from the plant. So. The plant is stimulating a lot of this biology, and more importantly, probably, it's stimulating relationships that are generally pretty specific. Now, there's a few bad players out there we call bad diseases that, that dial in on these signals as well. So that's one of the philosophies, for example, is if you can ramp up the overall biological activity, it makes it harder for any individual to kind of overwhelm the system because of the competition right. and the energy that it's consuming, not feeding or reaching 
a bad guy, like a, like, like a Pythium, right? Right. So uh, biochar now, they're finding that it interferes with some of the signaling. Again, because of the CEC associated with it, because of the surface area that it has, biochar can be a player in interfering with these signals and hopefully it's only interfering with the signals to the bad guys and not disturbing the good guys. Well, so, there's a I, lot of what unknowns <laughs> and there's no way I'm going to claim we've experienced the answers to these. Thank you for all the work you've done towards this. I can't wait to hear what the future brings. Uh, definitely seems like there's going to be a lot of benefit to golf hopefully in the future. Um, but unfortunately, I think that's it for today. Um, that concludes this segment of GCSAA TV Live, presented in partnership with Lebanon Turf. Uh, thank you, Dan, for your thank time. You. Appreciate it.